I am very happy to be here. Thank you so much for organizing this uh, this event. Thank you uh, so much for opening the floor to this very important issue that that have a new relevance nowadays because and due to the Russia aggression against Ukraine. Today, I will talk about the role of sexual violence in genocide and war. And the first part of my, of my presentation will be devoted to the sexual violence in Russia-Ukraine war. From the very beginning of the war um, on 24 February 2022, we, I mean feminist scholars, journalists, local people in Ukraine and the people everywhere, we see and hear from media outlets, from different both Ukraine and international human rights uh, organization, from officials news about the use of sexual violence during this cruel, unjustified and unprovoked war. And this make me to think, is the sexual violence and rape in this ongoing war is the byproduct of war or a weapon of war used by Russian forces in Ukraine? And this is the question that we should think about and to find an answer in the near future in order to, to help perpetrators accountable, in order to take um, necessary step to, uh, to help victims and survivors of this uh, violence. Force of violence, sexual violence in Russia, Ukraine war that we witness nowadays are rape, repeated rape. And in most cases, this is the gang rape when several Russian soldiers and uh, officers are involved. We also see threat of rape forcing family members to witness the perpetration of rape. We hear numerous cases when mothers are forced to see how their daughters and the sons are raped. Or the, the story of two sisters, where older sister was asked, uh, was asked uh, Russian soldiers to take uh, her instead of her younger sister. But they forced her to look with the phrase, you should see what, would ha what will happen to all Ukraine Nazi sluts. Those words they say to her, they said to her. Also, we have mutil mutilation of genitals. The pictures from Mariupol that were showed um, during the UN session, for example, on 11 um, April this year, shown, uh, show us the pictures of naked, completely naked children with tied hands while their parents are still dressed up. And according to local Ukraine journalists who were in Bucha, who were in Irpin, in Chernihiv area, in Kyiv Oblast. Some of Ukraine um, uh, girls, young girls under 10 years, were with torn vaginas, with mutilated genitals. Also, we uh, have cases of sexual slavery. And according to Ukraine uh, procuror, uh, 25 girls and women from the age of uh, 14 and to, uh, 24 years old were held in detention in Bucha. Everyone, I believe, nowadays know he, this name of this uh, locality in Kyiv Oblast, 30 kilometers near Kyiv, when different, where different war crimes were perpetrated by Russian for forces. And among, the, among those war crimes, we see sexual violence. Nowadays, nine of those 25 girls who were held in detention are pregnant. Also, we see different kinds of sexual torture. Who are the victims and survivors of sexual violence in this ongoing war? First of all, women. 
Because as we know from different cases, from different contexts, from different wars, sexual violence has a very gendered nature. When I say gender, I mean that most of victims and survivors are women and girls, and most of perpetrators are men and young men, like Russian soldiers, 18 years old, 19, 20 years old. Also, we have cases when some, when some pregnant women are raped. In one locality, 16 years old uh, girl was pregnant and she was raped while she was pregnant. Also, we have cases of for girls and the youngest um, one, which is known, is nine years old girl. But not only women and girls are victimized. We have also cases of men and boys. And one confirmed case is related to 11-year-old boy in Bucha, raped in front of his mother. But not only civilian women and men, girl and boys are raped. Here you see the picture of female soldiers liberated from the Russian captivity on 2nd April this year, together with Irina Voroshchuk, Minister of Reintegration of the Temporary Occupied Ukraine ter Territories of Ukraine. And here you see very obvious that those women with the shorn heads, their hair was cut off by Russian soldiers. Later, on the following days, we learned that those women were dressed naked in front of their fellow soldiers and were forced to perform some exercises. They were tortured. And uh, their, um, their hair was cut off in, in means of sexual torture and sexualized torture. We know from World War II many stories when women, um, including Holocaust survivors, including those women who survived the Gulag, also experienced shaving their heads and cutting their hair as a sexualized violence because the conjunction of the hair with the notion of femininity. So what we now um, have I mean in terms of combating sexual violence. We have situations when different uh, official bodies uh, disclose information about uh, survivors and victims of sexual violence. They are talking about necessary steps that should, uh, should be taken in order to provide help to those women, mostly women and girls. But we should understand that many of those women are in the Russian occupied territories without the access to the legal system, without the legal protection, with the lack of medicine, lack of medical help, and the lack of protection in general. That's why Ukraine officials can't uh, provide this, uh, this support. And when we talk in general about what Ukraine as a state done in order to help victims and survivors of sexual violence during these eight years of ongoing Russia-Ukraine Russia war, we see the, that known of survivors of war-related sexual violence experienced in, in Donbas region didn't receive financial compensation from the state since 2014. But we know that Russian forces and Russian-based forces, so-called Ukraine separatists, use sexual violence to civilians, both to civilians and to Ukraine female soldiers that were held in detention. Also, we, we know that some of Ukraine soldiers, um, men soldiers were castrated in captivity, in Russian captivity or in captivity in Donbas in general. But none of these people received the proper support from government. And I believe that now situation will change because the scale of this sexual violence, the cruelty of the sexual violence is very telling. And we can turn the blind eyes and we can't 
uh, we, we should develop some strategies, not only uh, for prevention, but first of all, for helping those women. Because those survivors, first of all, all uh, women and girls who are um, survivors of sexual violence, face many, many problems. And one of these problems is the influence of rape culture. Because of this rape myth about the proper victim and the proper perpetrator, many of those women are under the question, did you, did, did you do enough in order to protect your children? Did you do enough in order to flee the territory in order to save yourself? Why did you allow them to enter your house? Why did you give them your tea, for example? You, maybe you are a collaborator. Maybe it's your fault. And when I see those um, discussions, let's say, uh, I am very upset with this because ordinary people still are heavily influenced by rape culture and they produce those nasty comments, unfair comments, which have a great impact on survivors and victims of sexual violence. And because of the, the huge amount of those comments nowadays and the, because of this discussion in Ukraine society, um, we have many feminist journalists, many feminist lawyers who are engaged in this discussion. For example, some of Ukrainian media, and you see here the screen of Romanske Radio, one of the um, independent uh, media outlet in Ukraine, they put uh, some uh, instruction for media how to cover the question of sexual violence, how to not traumatize those women again, how to know not disclosure this uh, sensitive information, which could put those women at risk, especially when they live in patriarchal society, in patriarchal communities, in patriarchal families. And on the left side, you see very touching and moving article of one of Ukraine journalists, Victoria Kobelatska, about the influence of rape culture. She was uh, she talked about one Ukraine woman from, I believe, from the, the south of Ukraine, I believe from Kherson Oblast, but I'm not sure. So, um, and in this article, she described that this woman is left she she live in the countryside and she afraid to talk about what happened to her she just want to perform a, an abortion she just want to have a safe access to safe abortion in order to terminate this unwanted pregnancy and in order to avoid disclosure of this information to her husband, which is nowadays in the Ukraine military is fighting. And uh, she don't want her um, fellow villager to learn about, about what ha happened to, to her. And another, um, another big uh, obstacle, why women are not trying to, to seek justice because they don't believe in justice in this, issue in this question. First of all, because as I said previously, Ukraine government um, uh, did not enough in order not even to punish those perpetrators uh, of previous uh, sex crimes, but they did not enough to U Ukraine officials, Ukraine authorities did not enough even to help those women to show that they care about them and their sufferings matter. And um, the, uh, the another, uh, another reason for silence, behind silence, is that mo most of those soldiers, Russian soldiers, cover their faces when they perform violence, when they humiliate women and, ch and uh, children, actually. That's why women can't, um, can't provide their names, that the, they can't provide information about their combat unions, about their, you know, even about their appearance. The, yeah, and um, this is in general, make more and more complicated the issue of collecting evidence properly, investigation this crime and crimes, sex crimes and held uh, perpetrators accountable. In the several part, 
of my presentation. I will talk about my personal approach in my own research about sexual violence during the Holocaust in Ukraine. And my approach is based on the attentiveness to the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and sex crimes during the Holocaust. Because for a long time, their voices were silenced. So my aim is to provide spaces to those voices to see their trauma, trauma of rape and trauma of silence after the rape. So when we are talking about sexual violence, of course, the motivations of perpetrators matter. The uh, response of uh, commanders matter. The strategies developed by governments and international organizations in order to help survivors and victims matters. But what matters more is the stance of those women, um, girls, men, and boys who suffered sexual violence. And um, uh, in order to, to place their, their suffering in our, in our picture of using the sexuality and sexual violence in war and genocide, we should talk about effects of this violence, first of all, on victims and survivors. We know from many accounts of Holocaust survivors that many Jewish women and girls were murdered after the rape. During uh, uh, wartime, like in peacetime, the killings of rape victims is a common way to cover the crime and avoid justice. During the Holocaust, different perpetrators had different motivation to kill um, their victims. For Germans, it was, for example, the concept of Rassenschande introduced by Nuremberg racial laws. For local collaborators, the murder of their victims was one of the way not only to conceive the sex crimes, but also to conceive the looting of the property of uh, their victims, which could cause even more harsh punishment from their German or Romanian supervisors than the rape of Jewish women. We have a lot of testimonies about the young Jewish girl who were raped and murdered after that. And here you see the quote from the Balda Ghetto. Uh, and Sia recalled the family uh, with two sisters that were raped and killed after, afterwards. Another very huge consequence is and dramatic consequences of rape, of course, is lethal injuries. Some of women who were left alive by, the, by their perpetrators died after some time because of severe injuries resulted from rape, especially gunk rape. It was the case of the Jewish girls in Jewish agricultural colony Olizarka in Volynia, uh, Rivninska Oblast. During the pogrom, the, uh, that was perpetrated by locals before the arrival of Germans in July 1941, numerous Jewish girls were raped. According to Jewish Holocaust survivor Beryl Berko, during the first attack, 16-year-old Perla died from bleeding at the night of an attack. He attended even her funeral. During the second attack on the village, two days later, seven girls were raped by local perpetrators at the home of Beryl Berko, and one of them, Fania, died from injuries. Here you see the quote from the testimony of Leia Bandus, and she recalled another uh, huge consequences of uh, sexual violence during the Holocaust, and it's connected with venereal diseases. Many Jewish women and girls haven't access to medical help. And she described they were, they were rotting alive. And she repeated several times during her interview, because among those raped and, if, and infected um, with syphilis was her sister. 
very dramatic consequences of the rape and sexual violence is unwanted motherhood and unwanted pregnancy. At the beginning of Soviet German war, Mary lived in Rivne. She was 22 years old and she was married. Her husband was drafted to the Red Army. She had a one year old son. Then she was moved to the local ghetto. And with the help of Polish friend Kolya, she managed to escape from this ghetto. And she was living with Kolya, Kolya for some time. But Kolya turned into heavy drinker and home abuser. And she, during her interview, she talked about the sexual uh, intercourse in terms of violence. I was raped him, she recalled, every night. I can't call it sex. And she described how she got pregnant and how she was trying to get rid of this pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy. But the, but the local Ukrainian woman refused to do it because she said it's, um, it's an advanced uh, period of pregnancy. I can't perform an abortion. But uh, so she was forced to, to deliver this baby, to, uh, but she was not willing to keep this baby. She hadn't any, um, any additional sources actually in order to, to keep this child alive. And she asked Kolya to take care about this child and put him in some orphanage. But at the same day of the birth of this child, she understood that this child was killed by, by Kolya, actually by his father. Another very important and very, very dramatic consequence of sexual violence is a nightmare and flashback. And here you see the picture of uh, Galina. She was 20 years old Jewish girl during the World War II, when she was raped by a Romanian officer in Odessa prison in April 1943. She was bleeding after that and did everything she could at the time not to get pregnant. This assault it was one of the most painful memories in her life. As you see from the screenshot, during an oral history interview conducted 70 years after the sex attack that she experienced, she can talk about her experience without crying, without tears. Galina stated, I see him in my nightmares even today. I could paint his portrait. I see everything like it's happening now. The sexual trauma experienced by female Holocaust survivor was lasted not one year, not two, but could last it for decades, for their entire life. Here this, you see the picture of Anna. She survived a Holocaust and in Vinnytsia Oblast in Tomaspil ghetto. And during her testimonies, she recalled how, um, um, how um, um, during the Holocaust, she survived several rape attempts because she, she said that it was open secret that um, local perpetrators with their supervisors uh, raped Jewish uh, women and girls. And every time when they entered ghetto, when they entered precise buildings and barracks, the uh, girls were trying to hide and to escape. Anna was among those girls. And in 1944, when she was only 21 years old, she married a Red Army officer, Yaakov. In the following year, she became a mother. But her new everyday routine triggered traumatic memories of war. She recalled, when my husband was coming from home at night, fr uh, from work at night, he knocked on the door and I immediately ran away and hid. It seemed to me the Germans were knocking again. And we agreed with him to knock softly on the glass. 
Then I opened the door. I was scared. My nerves were shattered. And um, what struck me in many of those stories is how uh, sexual trauma experienced sexual and romantic and family lives of those women. Some of them couldn't even get married. Some of them were, can't you know, live uh, in um, this marriage. Some of them were left by their husbands when they found out that, uh, that their wives were sexually humiliated during the war. And it's very interesting for me was to, to learn how many women, Holocaust survivors, who were the main witnesses after the war during Soviet war crimes trials were asked actually Soviet investigators not to disclose the information about their rape. And here, for example, you see the picture of um, the criminal case of the local collaborator, ethnic German Falkenstern in um, uh, Genichesk region in Kharkiv, Ob in Kherson Oblast, and he raped repeatedly Anna. But when she described uh, the, the uh, when she described her humiliation, he she asked the investigation not to disclosure what she was saying about this. That's why. Um, on their, um, the final decision, court decision, we see that rape is not mentioned even. Falkenstern was charged with beating her, humiliating her. It was a general, very popular word used by Soviets in their uh, trial materials, but any mentions of rape we see. So in this case, Soviet authorities uh, actually take into consideration what Anna was saying because she was really afraid. She was terrified by even a, an idea that her husband can learn about her rape. And in this slide, you see another very prominent case and another um, local perpetrator, Yakiv Hrabovsky, from Odessa region, from Novopavlivka. And he actually, when he was 18 years old, he became an auxiliary policeman. And while guarding the group of Jews who, um, um, who were planned to be transferred to Bogdanivka uh, camp, um, he, raped, uh, he raped his classmate. Uh, a schoolmate, actually, not classmate, but schoolmate, and she was 13 years old, Rajisa. And when she was testifying in court during interrogation, her words were questioning. Her be behavior was questioning, and she was really afraid to testify. But another very important dimension in her case that she revealed the information that nobody knows about her rape, even her husband. And when he, her husband was actually summoned to the um, courtroom, he said, yes, I know, I, I knew and know nothing about this case. That's why this, this issue contributed to the fact that Hrabowski uh, avoid charges with the rape of Raisa. But when we talk about the effects of sexual violence, we first of all talk about victim survivors, but we also have a secondary victims. By secondary victims, I mean those persons who witness by their own eyes, first of all, raping and sexual humiliating of their beloved ones, their neighbors, their acquaintances, their relatives, their member, family members. And here you see, for example, a quote from the oral interview um, of Anne Kazimierski. She um, described the, the situation when her neighbor, Sara, was raped and she, after that, was, uh, was uh, uh, she died after, after this rape. Uh, 
And what is interesting in this regard, we have two interviews of Anne Kazimierski. And in one interview, she actually vividly described this case, but nothing talk about her uh, experience of attempted rape. But in the other interview, she revealed this information about when she about the situation when she was put at risk and when the aid giver Polish man was trying to take advantage of her and was trying to rape her and when she described the story she told I remember Sarah so in this situation she um, had these very vivid memories of what happened to her friends, or to her friend Sarah, and she was afraid that this could happen to her. In many cases, in, more, um, in many cases, we have family members, immediate family members witnessing how their beloved ones are raped. And here you see one of these cases from Neyleben near Krvirich, where and one of the rape survivors described how several Jewish families were put in one house and uh, the group of local perpetrators almost every night entered uh, the, this house. Uh, they, um, they loot their properties and they raped women in front of their mothers, fathers, in front of their children of different ages. But what is more painful even for many women is to be raped in front of their husband. And um, uh, here you see this story of, of this humiliation. And uh, this survivor, she talked, he, uh, he uh, means Ukraine partisan. And to her, uh, according to her testimony, he was um, a member of Banderici. So I believe he, she meant the Organization of Ukraine Nationalists or um, UPA Army, Ukraine Insurgent Army. And they were discovered by these Banderivets in their, in their, in Kosovo, uh, uh, in Ternopil region, in the forest. And this man held a gun over her husband's head and he, and he raped her. What is very important in this regard, that uh, raped in this precise uh, in this precise situation had two different functions. First of all, to show dominance over uh, those uh, vulnerable people, precisely over the body of this vulnerable woman, to show uh, superiority, to show the, to, to show the power. But on the other hand, this was the message to Jewish men. This was the process of emasculinization. This was the message, you can't protect your, your wife. You can't protect your woman. You are weak. You are not a true man. You are not a defender. But at the same time, sexual violence, why the sexual violence is used as a weapon of war. And in many cases, it works like an instrument of war because the sexual violence has a tremendous effect on the entire community. Especially, it's, um, it's evident in the cases of public rape and public sexual humiliation. And here you see you know, some artists work uh, from uh, Ukraine artist, uh, artwork from Ukraine artist Nikita Kadan. And here you see the, the yes, he, he used the pictures, very iconic pictures from Lviv pogrom of July 1941, when many Jewish women and girls were publicly sexually humiliated on the streets of Lviv. And um, in this violence, many, many women, Jewish women and many Jewish men were observers. They were witnesses of this violence because many women were street naked and they were forced to move around the streets in order to show the superiority of the perpetrators, the power of perpetrators and the humiliation of 
the victims. And it was also a huge, um, huge part of ethnic violence, huge and very important instrument of humiliation, of punishment, as it was, uh, you know, um, it was put, uh, it was um, understand by perpetrators because um, many of those women were punished, yes, because they belong to Jewish community, not only because they were women. And uh, uh, from this quote, you can understand that the whole pain of witnessing the sexual humiliation of Jewish women and girls. I have a friend in school, um, recall Ros Moskowitz, who became a communist, very active communist, a young girl, as a matter of fact, beautiful red head girl. A gang of Polish people caught her, cut all her hair off, and naked thrown her down the streets, screaming. The girl went home and killed herself. And those testimonies affected those pictures, those acts of humiliation affected the entire community, entire Jewish community, because it was a sign of weakness. It was a sign of humiliation and deep, deep, uh, deep violence, inhuman behavior. It was a um, sign of genocide of genocide and it was the instrument of genocide and in my book i will precisely talk about different functions of different situations of sexual violence because in some cases we have opportunistic rape but in other cases like in cases of pogroms in cases of ethnic violence we have this pattern of sexual violence as a genocidal violence. So I want to, to sum up my, uh, my presentation. I want to stress that when we consider the sexual violence, we should, first of all, pay our attention, put our attention, pay our attention to victims, to survivors. And, um, and talk about their sufferings and their cost and their price for, uh, and their price uh, paid during this war. And uh, their stories should be at the center of our understanding of sexual violence during war and genocide. Thank you so, so much for your attention.